right. Well, welcome back again. And uh, uh, this is an interesting time with interesting live. This is truly live. I know that because our board in the back is, is uh, um, showing us that. And so we had to be careful on the, the audio and the video would all match and stuff, but we're finally back to that. Again, wanted to thank you for coming back. You know, we're in a, a series on Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, the longest book in the Bible. Um, it's easier to read and study. Remember this book, though, if we divide it into two sections. See, there are four events and four people. Those are the only things you need to remember to remember the book of Genesis. Four events and four people. And we have the fall. In Genesis 6 to 11, we have the flood and we have the tower. And Genesis 12 to 50, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And today we continue our study in the first of these, creation. And, and, and how God created the universe, how God created mankind, how he created the institution of marriage, and how he created the institution of the Sabbath. But firstly, God created the universe. That was last week. We worked on that in Genesis chapter 1. Now, how offended would you be if I were to stand in this pulpit and told you that this book is nothing more than an ancient record of myths and legends, that there's nothing sacred or true about it? That's a book of lies that need to be eradicated from human society. age of only age six will have spent more time watching TV than he will spend talking to his father in his entire lifetime. Just say it. But no wonder that we're the very first generation in history to fail to pass our cherished values on to our children. Our children's thought processes and worldview is being influenced far more by the media, far more by secular educational institutions, all the way through college and universities than by the church or by their parents. The philosophy that I'm speaking of is the philosophy of evolution. Shouldn't you call it the science of evolution, Pastor? So evolution is not a science in my mind. It is a fact and, in fact, a religious philosophical belief that uses scientific terminology and methods to try to prove its very self. school and college and looking at sciences, uh, there's observation. One has to be able to observe the, that which is being investigated. A hypothesis. One creates a hypothesis and then sets out to verify that hypothesis through testing. When testing, that's how one hypothesis is either verified or it's discredited. It must be tested in a controlled environment and there should be repeatable results. To prove that your hypothesis is true, you must be able to repeat the results in a controlled environment so that those results can be observed and, and measured and themselves recorded. So I ask you, can evolution be observed? The answer is no. Were you there? No. Can evolution be tested? The answer is no. You can not test evolution. Can evolution be proven by repeatable results? The answer, again, is no there. You obviously can't repeat what you can't even produce for the first time. You see, the truth is, evolutionists do not begin with the evidence and then move towards a conclusion. They begin with a conclusion, and they look for evidence to support that conclusion. And all too often, they're even willing to twist and distort facts in relate, as related to the evidence to make it fit their pre-existing condition and conclusion. Here are three reasons, though, why, why I personally reject evolution. Logical, moral, and spiritual. First, the logical. Last week, we dealt with two logical problems with evolution. Spontaneous generation, 
that under the exact proper conditions, the temperature, the time, and the place, etc., decaying matter can simply turn into organic life. You may recall that Swiss mathematician Charles Eugene Guy calculated the probability of a single cell forming all on its own through unlimited time and particles and, and events as one chance in 10 to the 160th power, one with 160 zeros after it. But anything beyond one in 50 zeros is beyond reason by science. It's considered essentially impossible. Dr. George Wald, Professor Emeritus of Biology at Harvard University, who in 1971 won the Nobel Prize in Biology, wrote this in the magazine Scientific America. There are only two possibilities about how life arose. One is spontaneous generation, a rising devolution. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. There is no third possibility. Spontaneous generation, the belief that life rose from non-living matter was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by none other than Louis Pasteur, among others. That leaves us with only one other possible conclusion, that life arose as a supernatural creative act of God. So far, so good, right? Well, don't get too excited, because here's the rest of what he said. I, however, will not accept creation philosophically because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know to be scientifically impossible, spontaneous generation. That's totally irrational. It's impossible to believe in, but I believe in it anyway. So evolution is indeed a philosophy, a bias. It's the next best guess of a mind that chooses to reject God. Sir Arthur Keith, another evolutionist, said the only alternative to evolution is special creation by God. And that in itself is unthinkable. So we looked at spontaneous generation and how it's a problem for the evolutionist. Another problem is mutation. It's assumed by the evolutionists that the amoeba turned into an amphibian, then a reptile, and then a quadruped, and then an ape form, and then finally man. In other words, the species are not fixed in the eyes of the evolutionists. But Genesis tells us something totally different, Genesis 1, 11 to 12. And then God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kind of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. In fact, that term, of the same kind, is used ten different times in the creation story. It's the very reason you can crossbreed roses for hundreds of years, get all kinds of different colors and designs, but you'll never get a puppy. It's the reason why the... Uh, that we can do all kinds of cross developments and receive nothing of the kind. There's a joke that a uh, man took his brother to a psychiatrist and said he thinks he's a dog. And the psychiatrist asked, well, how long has he thought of that? Well, ever since he was a puppy. That's your George joke for the day here. The problem is these evolutionists, these gentlemen and ladies, have no transitional forms to, to point to. You've heard the phrase, the missing link. Well, with evolution, they're not just looking for a missing link. The whole chain is missing. Scientists have subjected fruit flies to some unimaginable testing and mutations. Over the years, they've come up with some very weird-looking fruit flies, some with nine eyes and such. Guess what? Every single result is still some form of a fruit fly. You've heard of the abalone, a mollusk that lives off the west coast. Well, apparently, once the scientist tried to cross the abalone with a crocodile, if it was successful, he was going to call it an abadile. But in the end, all he wound up with was a crock of baloney. See how I did that? Abalone, crock of... Yeah. Um, spontaneous generation. Mutations. Well, here's a third problem for the evolutionists today. The second law of thermodynamics. Remember, evolutionists say that simple life forms evolved into better and more complex life forms. A single cell eventually became a slug, the slug a frog, the frog a snake, the snake a bird, the bird a horse, the horse a monkey, and finally the monkey turned into a man. But this law says that everything actually tends to run down and wear out, that the universe is like a wound up clock that's slowly running down. A plot of weeds left alone will never become a golf course, but a golf course left alone will likely become a plot of weeds. Why? Because of the second law of thermodynamics. A pile of bricks left alone will never result in a beautiful home someday, but left alone, that house will eventually become a pile of wood and bricks. Why? Because of the second law of thermodynamics. 
If you disassemble a Cadillac and you drop the parts from a 747 from 10,000 feet, will they possibly come together again? The evolutionist would say, give it time, give it lots of time. And yes, it would. But the second law of a thermodynamics says it's impossible no matter how much time is given. So these are just a few of the logical reasons for not accepting evolution. Spontaneous generation, mutations, the second law of thermodynamics. But now how about the second one? How about moral reasons? See, evolution, I believe, is very immoral and is responsible for much of the immorality we see around us. Evolution has produced, for instance, the fruits of racism and Nazism. It all started with Darwin, the father of evolution. And Darwin was one of the original definitions of racist. How can I say that? Well, Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, it's a foundational book for evolution. To ask a, a person on the street what, what book would be used for defining evolution, they would say this book, Origin of the Species. But how many of you knew that that's not the whole title of the book? The full title to Darwin's book is the origin of the species by the means of selection or the preservation of the favored races in the struggle for life. I had to search and search for this illustration of that original title. For obvious reasons, it's embarrassing to evolutionists. But, but did he actually mean that, this favored races thing? Here's a quote from Darwin you won't find in any public school textbook. At some future period, not very far distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate the savage races of man and replace them throughout the world. Did you catch that? Darwin called people of color a lower life form who've not yet evolved to the point that which Caucasians have. That's not a quote from the leader of the KKK. It's from Darwin himself. Millions of people have been butchered because of that very philosophy of the survival of the fittest, that only the best, only the strongest deserve to live. Is it any wonder then that one of Darwin's biggest fans was Adolf Hitler? Because if Darwin is correct and humans are the ultimate product of that brute survival of the fittest, then who is to say that one race is not superior to another race? That was exactly the line of thinking that led Hitler to be convinced he was of superior race and that he could actually breed superhumans of Aryan descent. But what does that say? Genesis 1, 26 to 27, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Romans 10, 12 says, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly bless all who call on him. Evolution has produced racism. Evolution has produced Nazism. Did you know it also has produced communism? When Karl Marx, the father of communism, read Darwin's book, Works, he said it was the turning point in his life he felt he had now discovered the scientific foundation for communism. Marx was so enamored with Darwin, he reportedly offered to dedicate his book on the tenets of communism to Charles Darwin. But Darwin can thank his wife, who wisely advised him not to accept this so-called honor. So racism, Nazism, communism, also humanism. Secular humanism, it's an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to humans rather than divine or supernatural matter. An example, a simple example of humanism is the belief that people create their own set of moral ethics, their own ideas of what's right and what's wrong, rather than some absolute and universally accepted morality. And humanism is based firmly on evolution. The Humanist Association a few years ago named Carl Sagan as Humanist of the Year for his 10-part series on evolution. Truly, if, if man is the direct and special creation of God, then that means God has a right to lay down rules, and some people just don't like that thought. Evolution is truly immoral. It's produced racism, Nazism, communism, humanism. It denies fixed standards of rights and wrongs, all relative. It denies all standards of morality. What does the Bible say? Romans 1, verse 18 goes on to say, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because it's, he's made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. 
Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. And it continues. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So we've looked today at some of the, and last week too, some of the logical arguments against evolution, spontaneous generation, mutation, second law of thermodynamics. We've looked at Darwin and how his, his book, Origin of Species, has led to the worst morals the wor world has ever known and still to, it does today. So now let's continue with the third piece, the spiritual, theological reasons against evolution. Genesis 2 is, is the further study on, on the creation of mankind. Some evolutionists have even been so hard-pressed to find evidence to support their predisposed biases and belief system that they've been perfectly willing to accept or actually fabricate false evidence to prove their already existing conclusions. Take, for instance, Nebraska man. At the Scopes Monkey Trial of 1925, they were arguing whether evolution should be taught in the public schools. Clarence Darrow was the lawyer defending evolution. He brought in a leading paleontologist who said, we have evidence that a rape of ape men did in fact live in Nebraska a million years ago. Of course, this made the front page of the newspapers across the globe, and naturally, the media began requesting and then finally demanding to see the evidence. And when the evidence was finally produced, it was a tooth. One single tooth. And from that one tooth, they were able to extrapolate a jaw and then a skull and finally an entire frame. And from there, they put a club on his shoulder, drew him sitting beside a campfire and having him saying, ugh. But in the same layer of soil, not far away from where they found this tooth, not long after that, was excavated a second tooth, identical to the first. Only this one was attached to the jaw and skull and skeleton of a pig. So the scientists made a man out of a pig, and the pig made monkeys out of the scientists. So what about the Neanderthal man? He was pulled as an example, right? Oh, he's still in textbooks right now. They're still used in our country. But it was proven 50 years ago there was just an old man with arthritis. Peking man, skulls supposedly 500,000 years old. But 10 traditional human skeletons were found right alongside the Peking man, along with crushed monkey skulls and tools. How about the Piltdown Man? In 1912, a skull was discovered which appeared human, had it a jawbone which appeared quite ape-like. It was brown looking, appeared to be very old, 500,000 years or more, and was hailed as the premier missing link that we've discussed already. For 40 years, millions of students looked at the pictures of Piltdown Man in, in textbooks and museums. But after the invention of the fluoride test, scientists realized the skull was not 500,000 years old. Rather, it's more like 2,000 years old, and that the jaw itself was only 50 years old. Then they examined the teeth under a microscope, and they could very easily see that the teeth had been filed down by a metal file, carefully made to resemble human teeth. The, teen were, uh, the teeth were brown and old-looking, but that was because they'd been stained with iron salts, and then planted them to be found. The whole thing turned out to be a fraud, a practical joke on science. Java man. I initially thought he was extinct by coffee, but that's not the reason for the name Java Man. Discovered by Eugene Dubois, a gentleman who traveled from Holland to Java for the sole purpose of discovering an ape man. He brought back what he said was proof, but he wouldn't show the bones to anyone. He would only show them a, a plaster model of the bones. He said he had found a skull and a leg bone. The skull was obviously ape-like, and the leg bone was human. But Dubois left out certain key facts. See, the leg bone was found 100 yards downstream from that skull. And at the same site where the ape skull was found were also found two other skulls, each one obviously human. Dubois kept those two human skulls under the floorboards of his bedroom for 26 years because he knew if he admitted that he had found human skulls at the same spot as his Java man, then his missing link would be totally discredited. Just before he died, he admitted the whole thing and even shared that the skull of Java Man was really from the remains he found of a But before he admitted it, Java Man was already in the textbooks and the museums. 
Nebraska man, Neanderthal man, Peking man, Piltdown man, Java man, all hoaxes. And that points out just how anxious man is to make a monkey of himself. The big question is this. Ordinarily, objective scientists are not easily fooled or deceived. Why do these examples escape thousands of the best minds in the world? Because evolution is not a science. It's a philosophy, a way to explain away God and explain away any accountability to God. There are also thousands of Christian scientists who are creationists. They just so happen to be outnumbered by thousands who are evolutionists, yet they are both looking at the same evidence and coming up with two very divergent views of the answer. Again, the reason is simple. Evolution presupposes there is no God. But God, the Bible says, created you and I in his image. Remember Genesis 1.27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God loves you. Jesus died for you, and he has a wonderful purpose and plan for your life. Full faith in God's word, I believe that God created all that is in six literal days. That's creation. There are only two possibilities. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Evolution says, in the beginning, there was a hydrogen atom and ad nauseum, ad nauseum. Either God made man in his image or man made God out of his own imagination. My challenge to you this morning is to be objective and reasonable, to carefully evaluate the evidence each theory presents before you. And yes, they're both theories. You cannot prove a theory, and that's why it remains a theory, not a law of science. And so there's the evolution theory and there's the creation theory. I'm totally convinced, though, if you look at it all correctly and without bias, all the evidence will point to the right conclusion, that the universe is not random, but it's orderly. That the universe doesn't appear to be driven by chance, but by choice. Someone, something created the universe. That there is a God. That he created all matter that exists, including you and I. He has a great and glorious purpose behind what he's doing. I really believe that if you'll put aside all your predisposed assumptions and prejudices, and yes, we all have them. We come to the table with those prejudices to begin with. Instead, look at the observable as evidence before you, and I believe you'll have to conclude that surely this is all not some kind of cosmic accident. The story is told. The famed atheist Robert Ingersoll once visited the office of the great preacher Henry Ward Beecher, who took him into his study to show him some of his theological books. In Beecher's study with this beautiful hand-painted globe of the earth, I mean, it had all the mountains and valleys and rivers and lakes and oceans of the earth, hand sculptured and then hand painted with exquisite detail. Mr. Ingersoll said to Dr. Beecher, that's one of the most beautiful pieces of work I have ever seen. Who made it for you? And Dr. Beecher simply said, oh, nobody made it. It just happened. And see, to an atheist, that should be a reasonable explanation. When I see a fine-tuned, intricate Rolex watch, First thing I wonder is why I can't afford one. The first thing that comes to my mind after that is, wow, that's some kind of explosion watch factory to put that beautiful piece of time together. No, of course not. That doesn't just border on absurdity. It jumps it completely across the line. It's totally absurd to think that. No, when I see a fine-tuned watch, I immediately recognize there's a master craftsman somewhere. There's a watchmaker who assembled this beautiful watch. And when you take an even casual you know, which is a bazillion, gazillion times more complex and intricate than any watch could be, surely you would have to come to the same conclusion. This universe did not create itself. Romans 1.20. There are things about God that people cannot see. His eternal power and all the things that make him God. But since the beginning of the world, those things have been easy to understand by what God has made. So people, get this, so people have no excuse. You might be wondering to yourself, why all this emphasis on how things got started? I mean, why does it even matter? Why the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. If Adam and Eve were not two real historical human beings, then the story of Jesus makes no sense at all. Historian H.G. Wells has said, if, if all animals and man evolved, then there were no first parents, no paradise, no fall. If there was no fall, then the entire historic fabric of Christianity, the story of the first sin, the reason for the atonement, it collapses like a house of cards. Because Adam and Eve really did sin in the Garden of Eden, 
and that sin nature was passed on to all mankind, there is a need for a Savior, Jesus. Jesus said in John 5, 46, 47, if you really believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? And that's more true today than it was probably even back then. Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Moses wrote the story of our creation. If you cannot believe what Moses tells you, then how can you believe about him? I mean, if we can't trust the historical and scientific parts of the Bible, how can we trust the parts that pertain to our salvation, to our eternity? No. If evolution is true, if it were true, then you are only an accident, a complex evolved animal, and therefore worth nothing. You would be uh, knowing that there's no purpose in life, that we're going to the grave to become worm food. And if evolution is true, we're accountable to no one. There are no absolutes of right or wrong. But if the biblical account of creation is true, then you are a special and unique creation, God made in his image. And you have a purpose and a destiny to know God and to enjoy him forever and ever. So logically, morally, theologically, I reject evolution and accept the literal creation of Genesis.